All right, so this last section is going to be about the cytoskeleton and about what's going on outside of the cell. So let's start with the cytoskeleton. First of all, um, when I was in school, we learned that the cytoplasm was a jelly-like material, and we were sort of left with the impression that all the organelles in the cell were just sort of freely floating around the cytoplasm. Um, and that's not the case. They're not just freely moving around. They're actually held in place, and any movement that's going on is controlled. So the cytoskeleton consists of three parts. I'm just going to give you sort of general explanations. There's probably other functions that these perform. The first part is called microtubules. You need to know that they're called microtubules. You need to know they're made of tubulin. And you need to know that of the three, they're the biggest. And you'll see in the picture here, they're about 25 nanometers in diameter. You would not be asked that size. But I could ask you which one of the cytoskeletal elements was the largest or biggest. And that would be your microtubules. So there are these hollow tubes, as you can see in the picture. And what do they do? They are the ones that sort of hold the cell's shape. Now, obviously, in plant cells, you also have a cell wall. But if you think about animal cells, like the cheek cells we looked at, what's giving them a shape? Why aren't they just sort of all flimsy? And the answer is the microtubules. So they're holding the cell shape. They also compose cilia and flagella. Now, the only um, animal or cell, I guess, in us that has flagella would be a sperm cell. Um, but cilia do line certain, uh, like, respiratory tracts and things like that. And protists and other organisms may move using cilia or have cilia around their sort of mouth area. You may have seen in the pond water that they actually had cilia to, like, bring in food. So cilia and flagella are made of microtubules. All right. Additionally, um, so they hold the cell shape, the cilia and flagella. They also form what are called centrioles in animals. Um, you don't have to know that. I'm going to show you what that looks like on the next slide. But centrioles are the things that are involved when a cell is dividing. You'll actually hear more about them later. I don't know if you remember mitosis, where the cells, the microtubules form to pull the chromosomes apart. And there were these little T-shaped things at the end. Those are the centrioles. Um, and plant cells don't have those, but animal cells do. Uh, and also the movement of the chromosomes. What moves them to the middle during mitosis and pulls them apart? That's microtubules. Um, and the movement of organelles. And when organelles are moving around the cell, the microtubules control that. All right, this is a picture of centrioles, the little T-shaped things I mentioned. This is not on the test, but animal cells have these. And they basically, like I said, are little T-shaped things on the edges of the cells, kind of look like this and like this. But again, plant cells don't have these, and you won't be tested on them. Um, this is showing the cilia and flagella. So a cilia is not actually, or a flagellum, it's not made of one microtubule. If you were to actually take, for example, a sperm cell and cut off its flagellum and look at a cross-section of it, you would actually see that it actually has a pattern. It's called a 9 plus 2 pattern. There's literally nine pairs of microtubules around and one pair in the center. So a flagellum is actually a really complicated thing um, made of a bundle of microtubules. All right, the second um, component of the cytoskeleton is called microfilaments. Microfilaments are the smallest. So again, if you notice here, the 7 nanometers in size, the microtubules were 25 nanometers, and they were big and hollow. You don't have to know that it's 7 nanometers, but you do need to know they're made of actin, and if I was to ask you which one was the smallest or show you a picture, the one that you would want to pick as being the microfilaments would be the skinniest. One of the things they do is they can bear tension, meaning weight or stress. But probably the most important things they do all have to do with contraction. So when your muscles contract to allow you to move, for example, your muscles are full of microfilaments, mostly um, microfilaments. And then when your muscles contract to allow you to move, that's what's happening. Pseudopods are the false feet in like a white blood cell or an amoeba. When it surrounds and eats something by endocytosis, it's these microfilaments that are expanding and contracting. Or those little microorganisms you saw yesterday that had the little cilia around their mouth, they kind of move like an inchworm. Like they would get really fat and then, um, you know, or really skinny and stretch out. And then this little anchor piece would let go and go forward and they get really fat, that's actually the microfilaments contracting to move them along. So again, microtubules were really big, hollow, and held shape. 
Um, and then microfilaments are really skinny and, and thin, and they're made of actin, and they have to do a lot with motion and contraction. Oh, and cleavage, right here, this word cleavage, it refers to when cells, when they go through mitosis, they literally pinch apart in the middle and split into two cells, and that pinching, again, it's a contraction, this literally contracts and splits this into two separate cells, um, that cleavage is caused by the microfilaments as well. The last one is called intermediate filaments, and they're literally intermediate. I probably wouldn't even ask you any questions about them, quite honestly. They're more permanent uh, than the other two types, and they happen to be made of keratin, which is what's in your hair and nails as well. But honestly, I would probably only ask you about microtubules and microfilaments on a test. Intermediate filaments, I probably wouldn't even mention. Okay, outside of cells, cells, some cells have cell walls, and we actually covered this before, so I'm going to zip through this side very quickly. Plants have cell walls of cellulose, fungi have cell walls of chitin, bacteria have cell walls of peptidoglycan. These are all uh, different polysaccharides, if you're thinking those words look familiar, it's from our biochemistry chapter. Um, and protists, some have cell walls and some don't. If they do have cell walls, it may be made of different things, it really depends on what kind of protist it is. The bottom line though, is that the only kingdom where no members of the kingdom have cell walls is the animal kingdom. So that is a unique thing. Um, so that's something that you should remember. Okay, so um, the extracellular matrix. When you looked at the plant cells, the cell walls sort of sealed them together. In the elodia, you would actually see the cell wall really attached to the two cells. And the same was true really in the onion, um, I'm sorry, in the tomato. Um, and the same was true in the potato. The cell walls kind of joined the cells. Well, it turns out animal cells, because they don't have cell walls, they also need something that hooks them together. If you didn't have them hooked together, you'd be able to basically stick your fingers straight through your skin. You know, what is preventing that? Why are you not able to just stick your finger through and split the cells apart super easily? And the answer is what's called the extracellular matrix. So this will make more sense, I think, when you see the picture on the next slide of what it looks like. But it's made of glycoproteins. Glycoproteins are proteins with sugars on them. And they were made by the rough ER. Back on the slide about rough ER, it mentioned glycoproteins. And I had mentioned that one of the things they do is they form ID markers. They also form the extracellular matrix. Now, so the extracellular matrix is a whole bunch of fibers like this outside the cell. And they're sort of intertwined and that holding things together, extracellular outside the cell. Um, and then here's your cell membrane, if you remember, your phospholipid bilayer. And then inside the cell, you had the cytoskeleton. I'll just draw that in another color. Let's just make it this color. So this is the cytoskeleton. Holding the outside to the inside are what are called integrins. So these proteins in the cell membrane literally anchor to the cytoskeleton on the inside and the extracellular matrix on the other side. And that way, the cells are sort of held in place. In other words, remember, this is the phospholipid bilayer is sort of liquidy. So what's preventing that from just sort of, you know, moving and changing shape and sliding all over the place? That's going to be these integrins. They're going to hold the outside and inside, kind of link those together and maintain cell and tissue shapes. And here's a picture. So the feathery things are the polysaccharides, and these are your proteins of the extracellular matrix. And this is an integrin, and it's hooked on the inside to the cytoskeleton and on the outside to the extracellular matrix. And so this way, your cells, even though they don't have sturdy cell walls, they are anchored in place and anchored to one another. All right, and then the last thing we're going to talk about are cell junctions. So junctions are connections between cells. And we'll come back to junctions a little more when we talk about cell communication, which is another um, section that we'll talk about. But how do cells um, communicate with each other? You know, how are they attached to each other aside from the matrix? So there are three kinds of junctions, and I have little animated pictures to help kind of clarify them. These are in animal cells specifically. The first one is called tight junctions. So the purpose of tight junctions is to prevent any kind of fluid from leaking in between the cells. In other words, if you looked at the picture of the extracellular matrix, it had gaps in it. You know, you had these lines. So fluids could leak across here, and if this was one cell up here and another cell here, and this was the matrix, technically liquids could flow between here. You have some places in your body where you don't want that to happen, and a really good example is your intestines. You don't want liquids leaking from your intestines into the cells that are lining your intestines. 
So tight junctions look like little buttons here, little welds. And you'll notice that all the liquids here and down here, they cannot get between these two cells. These junctions make that impossible. So the only way these liquids would get into a cell is they'd have to diffuse, and your cell can control that. So your cell can very carefully control what gets in and what doesn't get in. The second one is called desmosomes. Desmosomes are for areas of stress. These, notice in the picture, have spikes. The spikes are holding these two, this is cell A, this is cell B, and this is between them. And not only are they connected, but they have spikes going in. So this is sort of like putting screws between, you know, in the, to build a table. You know, you really want to hold that together because you might shake it and move it. And you don't want the legs to fall off the table. So having these spikes, this would be, again, for areas where there's force, specifically your skin, your muscles, your heart. These are areas that are constantly subjected to stress, and you want those cells to be held together really, really well. And the last one is called gap junctions. And gap junctions, that's an easy one to remember because a gap is like a space. And the gap junctions, if you notice in the picture down here, actually form tunnels. So sometimes some parts of cytoplasm can directly flow from one cell to another, I mean, and again, this depends on the area of the body. You should be able to recognize these from pictures, um, and you should definitely know the specific job of each one. So again, tight junctions look like little buttons. They prevent fluid leakage. Um, desmosomes are, have spikes, and this is for areas of stress, like your skin and muscles, so that those, they don't get pulled apart even if they get bumped. And finally, gap junctions look like little tunnels to let things through. Now, plants have something called plasmodesmata, which I'll show you on the next slide, but you'll see it in the picture on the right here. They're just like a gap junction, but they have a different name because technically gap junctions are just connecting membrane. Plasmodesmata have to go through two layers of cell wall to connect two plant cells. So they have a special name. Um, and here's the last slide here, plasmodesmata. Oh, this is a picture here. Plasmodesmata, so they're like a gap junction in what they do, but they're channels between plants. And actually, if you looked at the tomato skin on high power, you would have actually seen, it looked almost, kind of reminds me of a pattern on a giraffe, you would have actually seen these plasmodesmata. You would have seen these connections between, the, all of this in the B cell wall, in between the, the uh, pieces or the cells of the tomato. Um, but the plasma desmata, you would have actually seen little lines connecting them. And that's the plasma desmata that, again, are, are allowing cytoplasm to flow between these cells. That's controlled. It's small. Only some things can get through. And that's the last slide. So that's the end of the cell chapter.